So these people with their stupid black boxes and their signaling of being virtuous, they can get out of my face. Like that is that's my that's my opinion. Because we're the ones doing something here. And for those teachers who are listening, you're the one doing something. So don't allow yourself to be hounded by these idiots out there that are all nin 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 on Twitter. Don't listen to them. Put the blinkers on and keep going because we are the ones that are changing lives. We are the ones that are making a difference. And these last few months have been totally devastating for me personally in terms of the movement in education for how things, how it is destroyed for those charter schools. It is so upsetting. Education is very much at the forefront of all of our minds at the moment, whether that be in discussions on the impact of lockdown on divides and inequalities, mask wearing in schools, how we should approach mask wearing in general, how we can close the gap between private and state education that's been worsened during the lockdown as a consequence of lockdown. And with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement across much of the West, how should we approach teaching our history in our schools. Well, joining me to discuss is a headmistress at the free school, Michaela Catherine Burble Singh, who makes my heart sing on her <laughs> championing of traditional school standards with discipline and a belief that every single child matters as an individual in her school, which should be the case in every school up and down the land. Catherine, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Now, Catherine, for those listeners that don't know, could you just briefly explain what does it actually mean to be a free or a charter school? How does it actually work? Well, it means you have more freedoms than a normal school. Uh, a normal school, you're run by the council, as it were. I mean, in the day, uh, it was the case that the council would send you all of your support staff, your caretakers, your kitchen staff. And before that, in fact, they'd even send you your teachers. Um, and in America, actually, it is still the case that uh, principals are not in charge of who teaches at their school. They're just sort of sent teachers and then they might be able to move on some teachers to another school and they do a trade. But it, it isn't the same as the freedoms that we've got here that we often take uh, for granted, I think. The fact that... Um, uh, a governing body and a head teacher can advertise and hire a teacher mm -hmm. that, that they want for their school. Um, and in business, people take that for granted all the time. Uh, they just assume, well, you set up your business and then you hire who you want and you fire who you want. You know, uh, in in the public sector, uh, it has traditionally been uh, a lot more rigid. And um, the big deal with free schools, because ordinary schools also hire and fire and do all of that in, in England. But um, what you're not able to do as a normal school is gather together a whole bunch of like minded people and have a certain type of school. So Michaela is very different. We are traditional. Uh, what we mean by that is we have traditional uh, behavior standards. We expect children to really behave. And, um, and then we also have uh, traditional teaching methods. So we stand at the front of the class and we teach learning as opposed to a more progressive school where the, the desks will be in groups and the children are looking at each other mm -hmm. and the teachers come and move amongst the desks and keep the children on task. Now, um, uh, if, if, if I wanted to set up a, if I was just running a normal school that wasn't a free school, I would have a whole variety of different teacher types in there, some progressive, some traditional, and you would just have a mix. And depending on, you know, as a child, you would go in from one classroom to the next and it would all be very different. At Michaela, we're all traditional. We all buy into that concept. And what the free school movement has enabled me to do is set up a school with a particular kind of idea and attract similar minded people to this project. And we are able to deliver the same thing across the school. You talk about being a market disruptor of sorts. And I listen, I think competition drives standards. I think it's a good thing. Mm. But what do you think then as far as adding more entrants into the market of things like low cost private schools or even new grammar schools? Yeah, I mean, I don't have a problem with them. I don't have a problem with anyone who wants to make a difference to children. <laughs> you know, I like those people. They're great. They're people who dedicate their lives uh, to not earning a fortune. You know, people who go into teaching don't earn a lot of money. Um, 
but they do it because they love children. What always breaks my heart are the people who dedicate their lives to uh, helping children, but be but because they're given all the wrong methods to do it, they're fighting and fighting. And, 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 and in that first year when teachers join, a third of them leave the classroom. They leave teaching because their experiences are so dreadful. And so we need to ask ourselves the question, well, so many teachers are leaving the profession. Why is that the case? And there's two things that they'll always put forward, which is behavior, which is terrible, yeah. and then workload. And there is a huge workload that comes with teaching. Now, we do our very best at Michaela to cut down on that as much as possible. And when I say cut down on that, I mean cut down on the nonsense so that teachers can concentrate on things that really matter and that will make a difference to children. So um, w we need to consider that point, really, that, uh, you know, if, if teachers leave, well, then there must be something wrong. And I think free schools are doing a wonderful job of, uh, of keeping people on their toes and of giving people a purpose. So all of my staff have a real purpose to change the lives of children in the inner city. And they believe in the traditional way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And because we're all doing it, you can then judge us on that. You can judge traditionalism. Yeah. It's very difficult to judge in other schools what works and doesn't work because you've got such a mixed uh, uh, bag of, of, of an offer mm -hmm. to the kids that you just don't know. Whereas at our school, you go from classroom to classroom, you're seeing the same teaching methods, you're seeing the same high behavior standards, and then you can make a judgment. Um, and so I, I believe in consistency. You know, children thrive in a consistent environment and in predictability. They like the desks being in the same way in each classroom. They like knowing that the behavior systems of merit, demerit, detention are all the same in each classroom. And I would say that far too many uh, senior teens allow far too much freedom to their teachers to be able to do anything that they want. And in 2020, we mistakenly think that freedom to just do whatever um, is a good thing. And, uh, you know, we have a quote in our walls that, uh, you know, on the school wall that says uh, self-control sets you free. And it really does. So people look at us and say, you're controlling the children. And I would say, actually, that order and structure allows them the safety to be able to be adventurous, to think for themselves, to be creative. One thing that people are always shocked by when they come here is how many hands are up. All the kids have their hands up. They're all desperate to answer. And you know why? Because they feel safe thanks to that order and that structure. From this week, schools will now teach LGBT inclusive relationships and sex education. I, I've, I'm curious, how free is a free school when it comes to this sort of provision from the Department of Education? And where do you believe the role of the parent should come in here? Yeah, well, I mean, I, did, I have to say, I haven't uh, thought too much about that particular mm. question because we're all thinking about COVID and just yeah, getting the school yeah. back open and back running to normal. But, um, you know, we had some uh, uh, Jehovah Witnesses, for instance, when we would do our Christmas um, lunch and we, you know, want the, the staff dress up as Santa and they come in with their pretend presents and they hand them out to the kids and everybody's laughing and so on. And we have Christmas lunch and, you know, we have all these, you know, uh, you know, crackers and all that sort of stuff. Um, w when we do that, the this boy who was a Jehovah's Witness would opt to, to sit out of that. So um, he does that. We also do sex education. Uh, we explain to kids about condoms and stuff like that. And again, we let the parents know. And some parents have, have opted. So a few of our Muslim parents have opted to have the, um, the children out of that. So I think parents should be given uh, the right to decide whether or not they want their children in that. Um, I'm very much a believer in giving uh, parents and families uh, as much uh, freedom and as much uh, uh, control over their children's lives as possible. I get very worried when the state interferes too much mm -hmm. um, because what people don't realize and people who work in schools um, will know that sometimes what we struggle with often is families who are totally disengaged, uh, who don't seem to care. Um, and there just are families like that uh, who just don't seem to be that engaged with their children's education. I mean, of course, we are in the inner city. And, um, and, and it's assumed that that's normal, uh, I think, by too many people in teaching and too many people on the left. And that isn't normal. I think those families have been made that way. And I think they've been infantilized by the state. When the state interferes too much with a family so that the family feels that they no longer have any impact on anything and that they no longer have control of their own children's lives because the state does everything for them. They lose interest 
and they become infantilized and they're made dependent on the state. So rather than each time ask themselves, well, what can I do about this? I'm responsible for my family. How can I fix this? They automatically look to the state. Well, what's the state going to do for me? What's the state going to fix for me? And what I would say, you know, with that expression of, you know, you teach a man to fish yeah. uh, and he, you know, eats for a lifetime. But if you just give him a fish, he just eats for the day. That's what the state does. It gives you fish, but it can't teach you to fish. Now, um, now you might say, yeah, but we're a state school and we're teaching kids. Yes, that's right. So I'm not saying we should abolish the state altogether. <laughs> I, I, I do believe that we ought to have a state and it plays a very vital role when it comes to transport and, and all sorts of things, you know, um, uh, ex education. I believe in state education. However, I believe that certain freedoms need to be given so you don't have to have complete state control. And that's what's so brilliant about state schools, uh, free schools, is that they are state schools and the admissions is sorted by, by the council. And, you know, we're just like any other school, but it gives me enough freedom to be able to create a school that is unique. And, um, and that is how I think we should always view the state. We want government, but we just want it to be as small as possible so that we don't take away people's freedoms, people's uh, engagement with their own lives, with their families, with their commitment to the idea of personal responsibility and duty. If the state is involved too much, you find that families just give up and just expect the state to take over. And that is never a good thing. You cannot live a fulfilled life if you are not feeling responsible for what you do with your life. The whole point is that you need to own it. That's what I love about free schools. We own this place. I've helped to paint the walls here. On the first day when we opened six years ago, I was putting the bins out myself. You know, like <laughs> this school is mine. And when something belongs to you, you're that much more dedicated to oh, that's it. That's true. So you're less likely to clock in and clock out. And we want the state to create an environment where more of that kind of passion and enthusiasm for what people are doing is, is, is able to thrive. Because one of the arguments in favour of um, sex education, compulsory sex and relationship education, is that actually that would advance um, acceptance of homosexual relationships and transgender people uh, who might have otherwise, you know, home lives in which that is, let's just say, not readily accepted. But it, do you believe that that's the state trying to play one the role of the parent but two a slight bit of social engineering well no look, no we live in britain so we believe in british values so it is already the case that i will give assemblies to the children about being gay i mean i i have done so yeah and i talk about i don't know various prime ministers across the world who have been gay. And I talk about famous people who are gay. And I say, I don't know if you know, but this person's gay and that person's gay and this person's gay. And hey, you know, and actually I start my assembly by showing all these pictures of various people, all these photographs. And I say, do you know what all these people have in common? And everyone's looking at me like, who the hell? I don't know. What do they all have in common? Because <laughs> I've, I've shown, you know, I've shown musicians, I've shown artists, I've shown prime ministers, I've shown various things, uh, people. And then I say, well, they're all gay. And actually, do you care? No. And the fact is, um, I, and I talk about how people are, have the right to live their lives as they want to, because we believe in Britain in those British values, which are the values of tolerance, the values of acceptance. Um, it doesn't mean you need to be gay. I mean, you know, we're a vegetarian school. What I always say to the families is we're a vegetarian, but you can eat meat at home. You know, <laughs> I don't have a problem with that. The reason why we're vegetarian and why are we vegetarian? Interesting point there, because we are multicultural. So we have Muslim kids, we have Hindu kids, we have Jewish kids, we have kids from all different kinds of backgrounds. And, you know, Muslim kids won't eat uh, pork. Hindu kids won't eat beef. Um, Sikh kids won't eat uh, any food that has been uh, altered in the way like halal or um, kosher. So, like, you, you can't find anything that would be appropriate for everybody except for vegetarian. <laughs> so India had the same problem. Everybody's eating different foods, can't make them all agree. You know what? We'll all go vegetarian. That's what we've done. It's entirely practical. So we have a vegetarian offer here. The children can eat whatever meats they want at home. But we have a multicultural environment. So we need to find a way to make that work. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, with the gay thing, you know, um, I talk about uh, homosexuality and I say to them, hey, look, it's no big deal. It's no big deal that some of you eat beef and some of you don't eat pork and whatever it is. Who cares? 
we are living in a multicultural society. So we need to find a way of making that work. And we are a secular school that is doing, I think, a good job of making sure that our children are, you know, you come here, it's like the United Nations and, you know, black kids are friends with Indian kids, with white kids, with Chinese kids, you know, like there's no sense of, oh, well, I'm different and I need to belong to my tribe. Yeah. Um, and which is something that I always ver worry about, especially in 2020 with the, you know, rise of identity politics and uh, interpreting everything through race. Um, we don't do that here. Uh, I very much believe that children should be allowed to be children. You know, I want children to have as long a period of childhood as possible where where they can just love each other for being children. And, you know, I would always say that um, certainly here and all the schools I've worked at, Racism is the worst possible crime. You know, no, if they ever thought anything was be, anyone was being racist, it'd be the first thing they would call out. Um, and that's good. You know, that's the kind of environment that we want. <laughs> and, uh, and I do think, and why do I give assemblies about being gay? Because I don't know if we've reached that point with tolerance on being gay. I don't mean at our school. I mean, obviously, none of our kids are bullied about that sort of thing at all because we are so ordered and we have such a great, you know, we have such high expectations of behavior. But I do, you know, I'm aware that perhaps in some of their communities, um, being homosexual is something that is uh, really uh, viewed with, with disdain. And so I'm trying to counter that by saying, hey, look, you can be gay and be prime minister. So who cares, you know? And this is a country where we accept everybody. Um, the kids always seem fine with that. Yeah. I mean, you know. <laughs> Uh, Catherine, you've mentioned in the past, you, you spoke there about um, British values and about the values that unite us all. And I've, yes. uh, that reminded me in particular, and you mentioned identity politics. It strikes me, and I don't know if you will agree with this, but it strikes me certainly that there seem to be a lot of people pushing these identity politics nonsense in order to actually divide us and to say, you're part of this group. You know, I'm part of the gay group, therefore I should have these values, I should believe these things things I should have this politics and you know putting us all in little boxes and you have said in your school listen I want my kids to recognize the what the British flag stands for what the Union Jack represents around the world what values we hold here in this country I want them to sing God Save the Queen to be proud of the national anthem and be proud of all of the the, the values and what Britain has done around the world I wonder why is that so important to you? And do you think we're at risk of, especially as far as things like race relations are concerned, that this country enjoys fantastic race relations? And, you know, long may that continue. It would be completely and utterly heartbreaking were that not to be the case. But is it the reason that, you know, you wave the flag, you're not ashamed of our flag? Is that because you recognise that the one unifying force in this country are those values. Yeah, well, that's it. So when you've got a multicultural society and you want everybody to get on, because, well, we do, <laughs> uh, the, you've got to find what you have in common. And our British values, our belief in what our country stands for is what unifies us. And so we believe in democracy. And I mean, I know when people say that, I know some teachers kind of roll their eyes like, well, what's the big deal? Well, it's a big deal. There are lots of places that don't believe in democracy. You know, we believe in women's rights. You know, if you're in Saudi Arabia, you're fighting for the right to be able to drive your car as a woman. You know, I mean, they, there's loads of countries. I mean, what, there's some 70 odd countries um, where if you're gay, it, it's illegal. You know, and I think there's about 22 where it's punishable by death if you're gay. You know, like the fact is, that this is an extraordinary, Britain is an extraordinary country. We have so many freedoms that we need to be grateful for. And I think too many people have not done much traveling. They haven't done much reading. They don't know much history. So they don't really understand how lucky we are to be in Britain. Um, and we are. And, and, and so in a multicultural community like our school, it is so important for us to find what unites us. And uh, so when, you know, England was in the World Cup, you know, not that I know anything about football, but I made sure I did <laughs> because I could come in and say, yeah, you know, did you see against Colombia? You know, so and we had English flags up everywhere. We, we sing God Save the Queen. We sing I Vow to Thee My Country. We sing Jerusalem. And this is very unusual. It's hard to find a state school where, where that singing goes on. And we do this at assembly. Uh, the children stand for me at assembly. You know, their headmistress, you know, the head year says stand for the headmistress. Now, 
some people would say, oh, I've just got a massive ego and I like kids standing for me. I mean, do I care whether or not kids stand for me? Of course not. It's about creating a certain kind of aura and a, and a tradition. So there's a sense of, you know, I heard our, one of our, my deputies this morning on the tannoy downstairs. So I'm in my office because I'm the Wizard of Oz. You don't know what I do. You know, I'm mysterious. And who knows? She's the headmistress. <laughs> and he got on the, on the tannoy and he said, I have just had a meeting with Miss Rebel Singh and she is not happy. <laughs> and, you know, there was this hush. <laughs> and we have to do our best to impress her today, you know. Now, and I'm in my office deliberately. I'm listening to this because if I was kind of running around and just being normal, then I wouldn't have the mystery of the Wizard of Oz, which is what we try and create. So it's the same thing when I walk into assembly. They stand for me because there is this whole drama and theater around that that allows them to see the kind of hierarchy of the school in a traditional manner, which gives them a sense of, of belonging to something that has order. You know, and so we were talking about British values. It's the same thing. I will talk about the Queen. You know, now, to be honest, I mean, look, I love the Queen, I suppose, but I'm not somebody who has, I'm not a royalist. I don't have those mugs with her picture on it and all that sort of thing. I, mean, I don't really care. But I know how important she is to bringing us together as a nation and as a school. So while I am at the top of the school, I have to refer to somebody above me. So I refer to the prime minister. I refer to the queen. That's why it's so important to me that we have a prime minister who we can admire. You know, like, and the, you know, I, it, it's, it's so important that we have these traditions to look up to. Um, and that's because that works. You know, the thing about small C conservatism is that we believe, because uh, I consider myself to be a small C conservative, that if something works and has always worked, well, we keep doing it. You know, there's no need to change it. And um, what you were referring to earlier about identity politics and people kind of identifying with their tribe. I'm black, so I hang out with black people or I'm brown and I hang out with brown people or whatever it is. Um, it is a worry. Now, I think in their defense, the people who are kind of pushing that, they want to find a way to make it so that everybody's happy together living in a multicultural community. And they feel that some people don't have as many opportunities as other people. So the Black Lives Matter movement, that's what they're saying. And, I, I, you know, I believe that there's racism. So I don't disagree with the stuff that they say around uh, that there is racism. Now, we might disagree about how much there is, because I don't believe that there's as much racism as perhaps they would suggest. But we agree on the blanket point that there is racism. Um, we disagree about how we go about dealing with that. Um, and it kind of comes back to my point about the state and about infantilizing people. If all you ever do is put your hand out to the state and say, please give me more, um, or you put your hand out to other people and you say, look, Mr. White Man, can you make it so that life is good for me, please? Because life is so hard as a black woman running a school. I need your help. So please, Mr. White Establishment, can you help me out? You don't see me doing that, do you? Mm -hmm. You see me taking control. <laughs> you see me going out there and making things happen. And when I've had a number of white middle class people from the left, I might add, who have tried to stop me from making this school happen, I didn't sit around and nurse my wounds and say, well, it's racism, well, it's really difficult, and life's really hard for me. No, I picked myself up and I kept on going. And that skill is what enables people to succeed. So with our children, I don't go on about how difficult life is in terms of racism or in terms of they're from a state school and they're competing with private school kids. I will tell them, you know what? Those kids down at Harrow School who are paying 30 grand a year, yeah, they've got karate and Aikido and God knows what on, on offer for them that you don't have. That's true. But are you going to let that stop you? No. You're going to make sure you're working every night and getting the best GCSEs and getting the best A-levels so that you can compete with them. And what I'm going to do is keep putting my hand out to everybody and saying, please, please, please. Now, that doesn't mean that there, it isn't good to have some help. And that doesn't mean that I would never turn down more money from the DFE <laughs> or that I wouldn't, uh, that I'm not always looking for help from people. You know, of course I am. But that isn't my, my, my reason for being, you know, like... <laughs> And, and that's my problem with BLM, is that they give up their their autonomy. They give up their freedom. They give up the, 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 the idea of personal responsibility. Different people have different obstacles in life. You are never going to make it so that everybody has the equal number of obstacles. 
And sometimes it could be the white public school boy. Maybe his parents were killed when he was six years old. Maybe he struggled with mental health issues. You have no idea. It isn't just skin color that decides how difficult life is going to be for you. There's a whole load of things. And there are obstacles. The point of us parents and teachers is to make sure that we are teaching our children how to overcome those obstacles, mm. not to spend our entire lives complaining about those obstacles, because I can guarantee you that if you spend all your time complaining about obstacles, you will never overcome them. Um, the best thing to do is to know what the obstacle is. So you need to be aware of it and then jump it. Right? And jumping it isn't easy. It might make, take a lifetime. It might take 20 years or more than 20 years as it has me to be able to set up the school, to know kids inside out, to know what I'm delivering. Well, fine. But you know, when I'm 85 and I'm, I'm on my deathbed, I can look back at my life and I can say I lived, you know? And what I always say to the kids is, everybody dies, not yeah. everybody lives. Yeah. And if you spend your life complaining, if you spend it putting your hand out all the time, and that's how you see it is what it is to be success, which is to get something from somebody as opposed to being somebody, then you will have failed. And you want to be able to, when you're 85, turn back and say, I live. There have been calls and moves, indeed, by the likes of the British Library and the British Museum to remove, you know, former slave owners, those with links to slavery, and um, even calls to rewrite history, their language, not mine. And I'm wondering, do you think it's necessary to rewrite our history in our schools? Um, what's really interesting about history is that uh, we don't, there, there's kind of no way of knowing what is taught in our schools. <laughs> and, and what I mean by that, the curriculum has uh, all sorts of black figures at the moment. Um, you've got Mary Seacole, you've got uh, Rosa Parks, all sorts in, in primary school, all the way up to secondary. Um, but you don't really know what's being taught. Um, and that is because uh, history is never assessed. Um, and what I mean by that is at SATS, at primary school, um, you're only assessed on English and maths. So geography, history, you have no idea what they've been taught. Uh, unless something is being assessed, you will ha never have any idea. At key stage three, so year seven, eight, nine uh, in, in, a, in a secondary school, again, nothing is assessed. So it depends, it's up to the school. And I wouldn't say that, you know, in some schools, they might not teach history at all. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so there's this idea of, oh, we need to teach more black figures. Well, are they even teaching history? You don't know. Now, what they do is they look at what happens at GCSE. But only 40% of children take GCSE history. So the vast majority of kids that go to school from beginning to end, we have no idea what they're being taught in history at all because it's left up to the individual school. There is an advised uh, national curriculum, but who knows? So um, I think it'd be nice maybe to do an audit by the DfE. Uh, now, I suspect, I suspect, uh, and certainly from what I've seen, there's loads of black history. And I say black history. I don't want to say black history, actually. I should say black figures and black events that are being taught because British history includes black people. Mm -hmm. It isn't the case that we've got British history and black history. Right? Black history is part of British history. And that is the identity politics playing out there where we divide people. And that's wrong. So we shouldn't talk about black history. We should talk about black events and black um, historical figures. Now, it is true that some time ago it was the case that black figures were left out of um, our, our history teaching completely, even in our textbooks. But if, um, you know, we don't, oh, I've given my, I had, I had a couple of history textbooks there. I would have taken them and shown you, but my head of history has taken them. And I could have shown you the dozens of pages in this history book with loads of reference to India, colonialism, slavery, etc. Now, there are other bits. Do they teach the Amr Amritsar massacre in India? I don't know. Do they teach about the Mau Mau rebellion in Kenya? I don't know. Um, it, I would be highly surprised if schools did not teach about slavery and colonialism. Um, now, there is a, a bigger push than that. People say, well, we should teach about African kingdoms. Um, there, it depends. We don't teach about African kingdoms, actually, not in any great detail. And that's because we've made the decision um, to, do, to teach a certain amount and to teach it well. We don't actually teach Roman history in, in the school. And the reason we don't teach the Romans is because we assume that they've got some of that from primary. Uh, and and we, we start with the early Middle Ages. Um, and that's because we simply don't have time. And that's us. We give them uh, two history lessons a week. In many schools, they only have one history lesson. Um, and then, as I say, 40% of them take it at GCSE. 
So uh, I think in a way this conversation about black history is a red herring. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if we want our children to succeed, the most important thing is that they should be able to read and write and be able to be numerate. Absolutely. 20% of our children leave school uh, functionally enumerate and functionally illiterate. Um, there's something wrong with that. Yeah. So my big thing, I mean, you might say I'm black, so why am I not, you know, flying the flag for more black figures and more black, uh, you know, uh, events? Um, because I just think that's such a small bit of, of, of the, a much bigger problem in education. I want kids to behave themselves. I want them to be kind. I want them to turn up on time to school. Those sorts of things are the things I'm fighting for. And uh, too many of your viewers will think, well, what do you mean? Isn't that normal? You know, it's not normal. Okay? <laughs> there are far too many schools out there that, where the behavior is poor and where, frankly, the behavior is so poor, people don't even know that it's poor. What mm -hmm. I mean is the teachers in there working, when I'm saying things are, gonna, uh, things are bad, people look at me and say, what do you mean they're bad? And that's because their eyes don't see the same things that my eyes do. So if the two of us were in the same school, they would look at one classroom and think it was brilliant, and I would see that it wasn't brilliant. And, <laughs> and that's because I see different things. Um, and that's about us raising our standards and seeing what's possible. And that's what I've always seen my, my role as in education, which is to demonstrate what excellence looks like. If you come to Michaela, you see excellence in every single classroom. And I, you know, the kids will take you around and give you a tour, and they'll take you anywhere you, where you like. I have no idea where they're taking you. Try and, find, try and do that in another school. Try and go and visit any other school and go into any classroom you want. You won't be able to do it. And that's because schools are awkward about showing you what's going on. And I say any other school. There's probably a small handful of schools who would do the same thing. But there, it's a small handful. You know, we've got uh, 3,000 secondary schools and we've got 20,000 primary schools. Uh, what I always say is the best way to hold anyone to account is uh, that sunlight is the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. And we should open up our schools to visitors at all times. You know, in my own borough here, Brent, it is the case that if you're in year six and you're looking for a new school, half of our secondary schools here do not do an open event during the, the day. So if you want to find out about a secondary school, the only time you can visit that secondary school for half of them is in the evening. Well, in the evening, the kids aren't there. You don't get to see the classroom. You have no idea what the school is like. And so people are having to choose their secondary school without any real information. Mm. I mean, I think this is outrageous. Governments say they have choice. Families have choice. Well, how is that real choice when you're not even allowed in the school during the school day to see what it's like? And that's just in October. Now, the other schools, other schools that open up with open mornings, um, well, they know you're coming. It's a planned event. My position is open up schools all of the time. Let people go in. Let families take responsibility for their child's school career so that they have to go and see. If, if the state takes that choice away from them, which is what the state is essentially doing when they say, actually, there's only a small number of good schools and they're all filled up. So actually, you're not going to have choice for them. And in any case, you can't go and see the schools. Well, of course, we've infantilized families. Of course, they're not going to be able to make a choice because they're not being given the knowledge and the information that would allow them to make a real choice. Yeah. And uh, Catherine, you mentioned before being a small C conservative, and it got me thinking about cultural conservatism. And there is a real um, concern, I think, about uh, by many cultural conservatives, and there has been for all of my life, much longer actually, as a matter of fact, about the march through the institutions. And education is seen as one such institution that has always been overwhelmingly left wing. I wonder... Why do you think so many teachers are left wing? And do you think it's appropriate for a teacher in the same conversations that we're having about the BBC? Do you think it's appropriate for a teacher to be able to give across their political views? Yeah. So what I didn't say was that I suspect lots of uh, black figures and, uh, and so on are being taught simply because there are so many teachers who are very concerned about that. And I know that just anecdotally, there are just so many teachers in our school system. Uh, so I suspect that lots is being taught. Uh, and what people might then say is, oh, but my kids don't remember any of this stuff. Yeah, I can tell you why they don't remember, because the teaching methods that are being used are the wrong teaching methods. So it's not that the teachers aren't trying to teach them this stuff. They are, but they're using the wrong teaching methods and then nobody actually remembers anything that they're being taught. Um, why are teachers left wing? Because teaching is a caring profession. And people on the left tend to be more caring. Now, I say caring like that because actually often too often what the left does, it, it undermines the people that they're trying to help. But um, 
I, I do think left wingers tend to be more caring, you know, so you have typical more right wingers, not all of them, because obviously I am a right winger and I'm a teacher and there are other teachers like me. But there are there are many um, more right wing people who, you know, go off and want to earn loads of money and they, they want to play golf in their free time or whatever. I don't know. So, you know, they tend to go that route. And there are lots of left wingers who go into more caring professions. So there's that. But there's also the simple fact that um, the reason why our universities are filled with are, are, are very left leaning is because the schools are very left leaning. And over time, they become more and more left leaning. Mm -hmm. It used to be the case that as a teacher, you were reluctant to let children know how you voted um, and you were reluctant to uh, side on one side or the other in terms of left or right. Um, and we certainly at school never talk about how anybody's voting or that sort of thing to the kids at all because we want them to be able to make their own decisions. And um, so, and, and I don't even know how some, you know, whenever we've done a, a, a an election, a mock election, when we've had real elections, we have some kids who vote Labour, some kids who vote Conservative. We've even had some kids who voted UKIP, you know, I don't know. I mean, like, like, and, and the point is, we give them all, we do assemblies with what all the different um, uh, political parties stand for, and then they make their decisions according to what they believe. Uh, the problem is, I'll tell you the problem, over time it's got worse, because it was always the case there were more, left, more teachers who were lefty, but it's become more of a problem because teachers see it as their um, kind of role in life to create, uh, to make children into revolutionaries. Now, what I mean by that is, the establishment is evil, so we need children to reject the establishment. Uh, and that's what it is to be a good person now. It's to be somebody who rejects authority, who rejects, who questions what, you know, what a more traditional view would be that actually we want you to be part of the establishment. We want you to gain the skills that will allow you to become a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher and so on. Um, and if as a teacher, and I'm not saying all teachers think this, but I think too many of them think it, that they are trying to create these revolutionaries, then you are imbibing your kids with loads of left-wing views. Um, and I know from Twitter, from some of my you know, followers, I know some of my followers are very frustrated with that, with children in the education system, where they feel, well, they don't want their children being exposed, you know, and some of them say they're being indoctrinated and so on. I mean, they might be going a bit far with that. But I suppose the reason why some families feel like that is that they don't, that school isn't giving the alternative view. And so whenever we, when we teach politics here, when we teach history, we always say one side thinks this, the other side thinks this, so that children can make up their own views. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, of course, how you teach children to be creative and how to think independently, yeah. by giving them lots of knowledge so that they can then bring, come up with their own it ideas. It gives children agency as well, surely. Yes, exactly. And, and that actually is a really good point about agency. I think far too often... Too many of us in education don't believe children have agency. Uh, so we think it's mean to punish them for naughty behavior because it's not really their fault. It's because their parents aren't very good or it's because they're poor. Or it's because they're black or it's because they live on a council estate or whatever the reason is. And I always think, no, it's not because of any of those things. It's because the child has agency and the child has chosen to misbehave. And right now, actually, um, we are teaching our year sevens how to behave in a Michaela way. And we spend an entire week with them, uh, teaching them. We don't do any maths or English or any other subject. We are simply teaching them how to behave in a Michaela way and why good behavior is good. Mm -hmm. And so right now, you know, I just heard them blow the whistle outside. Break time is over. The children are being taught how to line up properly, how to look at the head in front of you, how to keep eyes on the teacher. Now, all of that stuff, some people think, oh, well, that's silly, you know, just let them be free. Well, you know, if you let them be free on the first day, in the first few days in year seven, they're fine. But eventually that the frog in boiling water, that behavior deteriorates, and then they're bashing each other's heads into the, in, into the walls and the corridors. And then what is so awful for, for, from my perspective in education is that people deny that this happens. You know, I've met hundreds and hundreds of teachers, thousands of teachers in my lifetime. And they all privately will say to me, of course, that's what's going on, Catherine. But nobody will say it out loud. Mm -hmm. And I just I don't understand why. I don't understand why teachers just aren't honest about what actually happens in schools, because they're the ones that are having to put up with it. They're the ones who are being told to F off. And I mean, you don't want to have to go to work every day and have that kind of antagonism. You know, it's not right. It's not fair on teachers. And so um, I believe that it's my role as head teacher 
to headmistress is what I call myself. I believe that it's my role to enable teachers to feel strong in their classroom. And I partly do that by bringing consistency across my staff and by being able through the free school movement of putting like-minded teachers into one building so we can deliver the same thing. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I wish, I've always said actually the entire time that I've known of your existence that if I could clone you and put you in every single school, I absolutely would. But listen, I, I've got a few more questions, so we're going to, I'm going to move sure. a bit faster. And I, I wonder, what do you say to those students who fear that are actually scared, and we, uh, this is purely anecdotal, of giving their opinion, and it tends to be in universities over schools, but as, as you said, it stems from the schools, right? Who fear giving their opinion because they worry that their teacher will lower their grade or dislike them. That wouldn't be the case here at Michaela, because, of course, uh, our kids uh, are, are so safe that they're able to disagree all the time. Boris Johnson, when he was mayor, he, um, he came here, and he, he spoke about something that happened in, oh, I don't know, Constantine. And anyway, he, I can't remember the exact detail, but he said something in the class. And one of our kids put his hands up and said, had his hand up and said, no, sir, you're wrong, actually. The date is X, Y, Z. And uh, Boris kind of went, oh, I don't think so. But then he went home and he realized that our kid was right, you know. <laughs> and um, and our, our kids are, are, are confident enough to challenge the mayor of London, you know. So and they challenge us all the time. And of course, why are they confident? Because they have lots of knowledge. For people outside, it's very hard because I do think that there is a bit of a wall of silence and that people are made to feel like there's something wrong with them if uh, they don't toe the line. I mean, for all the, the progressives talk about teaching children to think for themselves. Well, it's exactly the opposite. <laughs> they insist that they should think in a certain kind of way. And you do not have diversity of thought in these kinds of places. Yeah. Whereas at Michaela, you really do have diversity of thought both across the staff and the pupils. Now, should morality and ethics become part of the school curriculum? Are, are we focused enough, and you did hit on this earlier, are we focused enough on creating not just um, people that think they want to do good or be seen to do good, but actually be good? Yeah, and that, it's funny you say that because I, it's what I say to my staff all the time, always judge everything that anyone ever says to you as, is that them signaling or is that them actually doing? So when people put black boxes on Instagram, they're just signaling that they're anti-racist. They're not actually doing anything. When people go around, oh, I don't know, on Twitter and say, oh, look how wonderful I am, X, Y, and Z, that's them signaling. You know, the thing that I say that, why should you trust me? Because for over 20 years, I've been in my school every day at 6.30 a.m. <laughs> and I work very hard for my children. So that's why you should trust me. Not because I say X, Y, and Z, but because I walk the talk. Our motto is work hard, be kind. I mean, sadly, you know, what's really sad. We got that motto from KIPP schools, charter school in America, uh, work hard, be nice. And we decided we we're going to be slightly different and we called it work hard, be kind. Um, and it's a great motto because I always say, you know, we're trying to do a million things for these kids. We want them to, uh, you know, achieve their potential and be all sorts of things. But if at the very least for every child who leaves the school, they are those two things. If we've managed to make sure that they can work hard and be kind, that if for everybody, I feel that we have achieved. That's really good. And it's the same thing with KIPP. It, uh, it, at KIPP now and uh, Uncommon Schools and success, the Success Academy, these are three big charter schools in America that are traditional in their approach. And they have done amazing things with the vast majority black intake, poor black intake of kids in America. And uh, because of all of this nonsense over the last few months with BLM, they have now abandoned their motto, work hard, be nice, because apparently it's systemically racist. Wow. Now, I, I just... I despair. You know, I, we are going to be working hard and being nice until they take me out of here in a coffin. I tell you, they're going to have to kill me. There is no way that I'm ever giving up on that and on giving up on the standards that we've got in this school. And I don't understand how how this is happening. I don't understand how the so-called revolutionaries are making things. I mean, it's not just that they've given up work hard, be nice. All of those 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 academy, well, uh, charter schools in America have um, they're allowing them to wear trainers. They're allowing them to, uh, it's okay if they don't have the right uniform. Uh, they're not going to give them infractions for, um, you know, silly behavior, small behavior. And like I just said about the frog, well, you know what? If you don't give them little demerits and detentions for the small behavior, you're going to end up mm -hmm. with big issues. And they have been pressurized because I know that the leadership of these schools don't want it, right? They don't want it. They don't believe in this stuff. 
So they believe in work hard, be nice. Um, those two guys who do these two Jewish guys who set up camp and have, you know, schools across the country, uh, even Mark Moscovich, who did uh, so the Success Academy in New York. These are people who have dedicated their lives to children, you know, and I have such respect for them. I mean, I have total respect for them. And they have been forced into this position now by the, the movement that apparently is about not being racist. Well, putting a, I can tell you this for nothing, putting a black box on Instagram does not change child, black children's lives, but making sure they turn up on time and teaching them how to work hard and be kind does. It transforms their lives for the better. You know, when I think about that boy who uh, told Boris that he didn't know what he was talking about, he's now in year 13. And right now he is applying to Oxford and Cambridge and he's gonna get him. there. Yeah. And you know why? Because I and my staff are in school every day before 7 a.m. That's why he's going to do that. So these people with their stupid black boxes and their signaling of being virtuous, they can get out of my face. Like that is, that's, my, that's my opinion. Because we are the ones doing something here. And for those teachers who are listening, you're the one doing something. So don't allow yourself to be hounded by these idiots out there that are all nin, 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 nin on Twitter. Don't listen to them. Put the blinkers on and keep going because we are the ones that are changing lives. We are the ones that are making a difference. And these last few months have been totally devastating for me personally in terms of the movement in education for how things, how it is destroyed for those charter schools. It is so upsetting. You know, for anybody who's interested, Thomas Sowell has written just now, it's just come out. The man is 90 years old and he's just written this great book called Charter Schools and Their Enemies. And you must read it. And um, in England, I don't know if you can actually get the paper copy. You can get it on Audible. And um, it, is, it, it is such a great book. He talks mainly about the Success Academy by Eva Moscovich, in, uh, who's, you know, she's in charge of it, in, in New York, and the amazing things that they do. And what breaks my heart is that she and her colleagues have now been forced to back down on some of these issues that are so crucial for children who come from disadvantaged backgrounds to succeed. Um, and I, I just, you know what's really sad for me is that in Martin Luther King's day, it was easy to know the difference. White hood, bad. Mm. Marching against the white hoods, good. You know, it was easy. Nowadays, it's much more difficult. Nowadays, uh, you know, they accuse me. You know, they accuse me of being a bad guy. And, um, and, and they are not the good guys. They are, they are destroying children's lives. And um, they have blood on their hands, as far as I'm concerned. And it makes me so furious. But anyway, I mean, look. I, I, you know, all we can do, what I always say to my staff is, all we can do, put our heads down and we keep on going. And, and what I always say to the kids is, when you fall down, you pick yourselves up, you keep on going. And so this was a massive blow to the traditional new movement in America. Um, less so here, although, you know, I do worry about people running around and rewriting their history curriculum or whatever it is, as opposed to thinking, well, how are we actually teaching this curriculum? Are the teaching methods that we're using the correct ones to make sure that we have memory as part of our focus in the lesson so the children remember this stuff? You know, I I worry that we concentrate on the wrong things. And, um, you know, I mean, look, all we can do is keep going. That's what, that's what I do. Definitely. I just keep going. <laughs> well, yeah, and hopefully you will go on and on and on. Finally, Catherine, I wonder if you might summarize for us what you would like to see from political discourse moving forward. You know, you're someone who's long argued that uh, at least as far as me following your social media presence is concerned, that we should speak with those that we disagree with, you know, reach out across the aisle, learn from each other, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And I'm thinking, especially given the current uh, media firestorm over former Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott, what would your message be to those arguing not just over Tony Abbott's Catholic faith, precluding his position in UK trade, and, you know, he's someone who's negotiated a hell of a lot of trade deals. So you'd think he'd be ideally suited for it. But, you know, his politic, his his views, his Catholic views, his faith uh, apparently preclude him from doing that. I is this a sign that our political discourse is worsening? And how, if so, how do we actually improve it? Yeah, well, I mean, this is the intolerance of the left, you know, um, the, the, and being a Catholic, they don't tolerate. But there are other things you know, oh, I don't know, I was saying about how some of our kids and some of their communities might not be uh, so open to homosexuality. Uh, bizarrely, the left don't seem to mind that. That's OK. <laughs> but but it's not OK to be Catholic. So they pick and choose who they're going to allow to have dif differing opinions. Um, I mean, 
no, I don't have a t- problem with Tony Abbott. Of course I don't. I mean, I, I, I love having people uh, have different opinions to me. Um, uh, my senior team are, uh, is filled with that so that they can say, no, Catherine, we think you're wrong on that. Oh, no, that doesn't work and so on, because that gives me challenge. I want that. I mean, you were asking me earlier before we came on air about um, a video I posted last night uh, mm-hmm. where these two black British guys are having a conversation about uh, Trump. And I think it's a really great video because um, uh, they're, they're, they're friends of mine. I mean, I know them oh. and uh, they're discussing Trump's policies and why they believe that um, or at least certainly one of them believes that um, and he, he's very much pro Trump and he's he's pro Trump because he believes that Trump it makes things better for black people in America. And, and he explains why. And he goes into real detail. Now, I am not pro-Trump and I'm not pro-Trump because I just find him so rude and crude and gen- generally awful. <laughs> and I sort of think that, you know, uh, the, the president of the free world should have a little bit more decorum and should not be tweeting China in capital letters at 4 a.m. Um, you know, I, I just those are my expectations. But, you know. I can't really disagree with my friend when he make, puts forward those arguments because he's he's right about those those, those arguments. And um, but he and I disagree ultimately. Uh, but we're friends. <laughs> and and I and I and I post his his video on Twitter and say, hey everybody, come and look at this because you're going to find out a lot about Trump's policies. Um, so, you know, why can't we be friends with people who don't think exactly like us? Mm-hmm. Um, I also have friends who are on the left. And who think, oh, you know, that's Catherine. She's she's a conservative, and that's how she is. And <laughs> and um, you know, we might disagree vehemently about Meghan Markle, for instance, because my opinion is, oh, well, actually, you know, well, you know what I think about royalty, and they think she broke free, and isn't it wonderful, and da da da, and you know, what they think, what they think, I think differently, but we're still friends, you know, <laughs> like I, I, and that's my friends, let alone somebody who I don't even know holding a post being able to deliver well in the post that he's been hired to deliver for, you know, I, I, the left is highly intolerant. They say that they are tolerant, but they are the most intolerant people around and they really need to check themselves. You know, they talk about checking privilege. Well, check your intolerance and um, uh, stop being so petty, you know, with only certain types of people. Um, it, it, and, and the reason why they should do that is because it allows us to think outside the box. It allows you to be independently minded and to form your own views. You know, I'm really grateful for this friend of mine who tells me about Trump because, uh, you know, I understand that all the stuff that I hear often about Trump is not true. Now, I may still not be pro-Trump, but I'm able to uh, sift through all the nonsense Mm -hmm. that comes, you know? And there's just so much nonsense out there. And I would say that's for people both on the right and the left. You need to have differing views in your life so that you're challenged. And um, it's such a great shame that too many people, that, t- that there are just too many people out there that don't, that don't think like that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But with more people like you, Catherine, we'll get there, I'm sure we will, because goodness <laughs> only knows that cultural conservatives need more people fighting in their corner, don't they? Um, yes. But Catherine Burble Singh, that makes my heart sing. Thank you so much for enjoy, uh, joining me today and being with Reasons UK. Where can people find you on Twitter? Yes. So my name, I mean, embarrassingly enough, is Miss Snuffy. So Miss underscore Snuffy, S-N-U-F-F-Y. That's because I used to write a blog which was called To Miss With Love. And I was I I named myself Miss Snuffleupagus. Over time, it became Miss Snuffy for short. And and those of you who may have known Sesame Street, Mr. Snuffleupagus was Big Bird's friend and nobody could ever see Snuffleupagus. He was this big mammoth elephant. And it was uh, uh, it was about being the elephant in the room. Right. And uh, and that's why I'm called Miss Snuffy, because as I said about education, there are too many elephants that we never talk about and we pretend aren't there. And uh, I, I wish we would speak more of the truth. Amazing. Thank you very much, Catherine. Thanks for having me.